This video does not stand independent, but rather is part of a much larger three-part video series that I have produced on the Second Boer War, which is to say, the entire length of the conflict, how it started, why it started, uh, how it was actually fought, and then how it ended, all for Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian, on his new website. That being, as you may expect, thearmchairhistorian.com. I will include a link to Mr. Johnson's website in the description down below, as well as to his own video announcement for it, uh, because of course I am hardly the only person to have contributed content to his new website. Really, there's quite a, a massive slew of other uh, YouTube personalities whom you may be uh, so inclined to see some of their content on there as well. Think of it as a, uh, a Netflix for historical videos, if you will. But um, yes, indeed, if you are so inclined to see the other three videos that I've made on the Second Boer War, that is where you will find them. But for now, consider this something of a bonus and addendum and an add-on, if you will, to that series for all of you, my regular dear viewers. Here we're going to be talking about the perception of the Boer in British society. So not necessarily the war itself, not how it went, or even what the Boers were really like, but rather how did the British Empire, British citizens, view their enemy, the Boer peoples, during that conflict, again, the Second Boer War. And it's very important, I think, in order to understand the Second Boer War that we look at exactly how the British did perceive their enemy, because, of course, if you know anything about the conflict, and if you don't, then hop on over to the Armchair Historian and I, oh, how convenient, I have three videos talking all about the history of the war and everything. Um, you'll know that one of the most infamous aspects of the conflict was the British policy of interning uh, Boer refugees in refugee camps, or concentration camps, as they called them. Fairly a new uh, concept at the time, more or less debatable, you get the idea, though. Uh, they would take the people who were made homeless as a result of a scorched earth um, war being waged by both sides during the conflict, throw them into these refugee camps or concentration camps, and while theoretically they were meant to just house the people and keep them away from the Boer commandos, unable to provide aid and give supplies and whatnot to the enemy during the conflict, uh, really the conditions were absolutely horrible in them, and of course over 26,000 Boer individuals would end up dying as a result of those terrible conditions. And it is such an instrumental part of understanding uh, why that took place, how it took place, uh, and you have to understand how the British saw the Boers during the war. So, to put it very simply, there are, very broadly speaking, two camps during the Second Boer War on how the British viewed their enemy. There's, if you will, the positive light, the positive way to see the Boers, and there's the negative way to see the Boers. Uh, first things first, let's start off with the positive way that some Britons saw the Boers. And now again, I won't be speaking as far as how many people viewed them in this way, as a, how um, you know, widespread each of the notions were. Uh, it's very, very difficult to nail those sorts of things down. I'm just, again, going to be talking very, very broadly over all these subjects. And, and if you're interested in reading more on the ideas, then I will also leave in the description down below a number of different um, books and articles, things that you can go to to sort of learn a little bit more about the subject yourself, if you are so inclined. So the positive way of seeing the Boers. Well, who are the Boers, of course, but uh, Dutchmen who settled in South Africa and then when the British came into the region, like back during the Napoleonic Wars, were slowly but surely sort of forced off their land, forced, um, they left them willingly. It, again, it's a complicated history um, and you can see it both ways depending on how you look at the actual history. But suffice to say, after the British conquered South Africa during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Boers, for one reason or another, moved up north in what was called the Great Trek, and they formed two independent republics in the interior of the African continent. Um, these were on the Veld, the Veld being sort of the South African countryside, again, to put it simply. Um, and they were largely, at least it was seen, it's not necessarily entirely true, but, but the way it was seen is that these Boer republics were fiercely independent, that much is true, uh, fiercely independent and largely cut off from mainstream, if you will, European society. 
Now, there's a positive way that many Britons saw this. They looked at the Boers, who were independent uh, farmsteaders, if you will, sort of out there in the countryside, you know, surviving by, by the grit of their own, you know, national characteristics. They, they, were, they were hardy, they were independent, they were fiercely independent peoples. They, um, you know, they knew how to take care of themselves. They uh, didn't look to others for aid. They, they were, if you will, uh, untamed in a particular way. They were not so um, regularly involved in society as those more industrial nations over in Europe. They, they were cut off from European civilization. They were living, to put it very simply, uh, rather 18th century style lives, an older pre-industrial kind of life. And, and that aspect of it, there being a pre-industrial society, Kind of, sort of. Obviously, they were still in some ways benefiting from the Industrial Revolution, but the way that these individual independent farmsteaders were living was, at least to outside observers, very much reminiscent of an older, more rustic way of life. And compare that agrarian, that rustic lifestyle to a European industrialized lifestyle and society. Uh, an area where the grand majority of people, or, or at the very least I should say, a much greater proportion of the population is now living in urban centers, in large, heavily industrialized cities. Now, of course, as we're all aware, the Industrial Revolution had a massive impact on the natural environment in these industrial centers, uh, again, in Europe at least. Uh, and what's more, of course, it had a massive impact on the actual people living within these centers. Many of the more uh, romantically inclined individuals, if you will, of uh, European and British society during the Victorian era looked at this encroaching uh, industrialization of society, the smoke blacking out the skies, the trees and the forest being mowed down to clear more land for the industrial process, and more and more coal and ores being extracted from the earth forcefully by human hands and metal and machines and whatnot to fuel the fires of the industrialization, uh, you know, more and more people being uprooted from their homes, from these traditional idyllic farmsteads where they were more in tune with the, the natural world around them and being forced to move into these large city centers where they're being tightly packed together, you know, sort of mashed together in great human, just masses, the stinking masses of humanity type thing, these industrial workers. Their entire lives, of course, being hammered and regimented into a very factory type system where, you know, you don't wake up with the sun, you wake up at 5 a.m. You go into the factory and you work at six or seven and you stay there until the end of the day. And you, uh, people aren't seeing the sun. They're, they're being inside all the time. They're breathing in these horrible fumes. We all know that narrative, of course, the idea uh, of the horrible lot in life of the average industrial worker, at least, again, when compared with our modern day luxuries. And as far as the Victorians were concerned, some of the Victorians, of course, many of them would look at those factories and say, ah, oh, yes, wonderful signs of progress, w wonderful stuff. Um, at least in some uh, of the Victorian's eyes, again, those more romantically inclined individuals, they're looking at these changes and they're seeing not only, of course, can we look back and say, oh, it's horrible compared to how we live. They're saying, this is horrible compared with how people used to live. That more, again, idyllic, agrarian, countryside, cottage-based economy that people tend to idealize in its own right way more than it should be, but, but you get the idea. They look at the way that the Boers are living, these independent, these hearty, breathing the fresh air of the Welt on the, on the, on the countryside and whatnot, um, you know, taking care of themselves, not relying on society and, and working their own land, their own land for their own profits and whatnot, not relying on, on the wages of the factory overlords, etc., etc. Um, you know, it, it's very much an individualistic, rugged, again, rustic appearance that is just so much more traditional, so much more pure, if you will, and natural than the way that the European uh, peasantry, if you, if you would call them that, uh, are living today in the Victorian era. And of course, as far as the British were concerned during the Second Boer War, this wasn't just a matter of romantic ideals and, and stereotypes and of conjecture saying, oh, this is surely how it is, rather, scientific thought, sort of medical thought, many people in the British Isles were looking at their population medically in a scientific fashion and actually drawing these conclusions like through logical means, not merely through 
conjecture of what they want and what they idealize in a former world. You see, during the Second Boer War, this is an example that's often cited, during the Second Boer War, of course, it, it grew out of control for the British rather rapidly. They needed a lot more bodies in their army than they had really ever needed for, you know, many, many years before this. Or really, since, like, what, the Crimean War, the Napoleonic Wars, they really hadn't, anything, hadn't had anything this big for quite some time. So they need men to, to fill their ranks. And, of course, they do the traditional recruiting methods, uh, obviously nowhere near so extreme as it was during the First World War. But, but they're asking for volunteers for their army. And the thing is that as these industrial, urban, working, lower class, these poor populations were going in to, you know, volunteer for service from the factory life to an army life. Many of them, like ridiculous numbers of them per, compared to what they were expecting, were actually being turned down as being medically unfit for service, for military service. It sort of showed the British for like the first time in ages, the result that this industrialization was having on their society was, we don't actually have the means anymore to defend ourselves. In a, now, that's an over-exaggeration, I think, because clearly the Boers were not a threat to the British Isles in terms of, you know, actual military matters. But they, they were looking basically at these old Victorian ideals of, of masculinity, of strength, of martial prowess, and the ability to defend yourself, your family, and your king, at, Queen, rather, and your country. Sorry, I went a little bit World War I there. But to defend queen and country, as it were, from these foreign foes, to, you know, have those traditional Victorian masculine traits, which were just so ridiculously, uh, you know, promoted and held in high regard during this time period. And the population wasn't meeting the standard. They were failing the test. They were weak. They were having breathing problems. They, they were asthmatic. The society was asthmatic. And in, you know, the Victorian era, that's a really, really bad thing compared to what they like to think of themselves as. You know, they, they always, you know, have these portrayals of the, the proud, the courageous, the young, the white uh, soldier, you know, uh, you know, trucking over across the African veldt and, and subduing, you know, the native soldiers for civilization and everything. You know, there's very um, almost Aryan portrayal. But then you look at the reality and, and the British population was, was seemingly, at least, of like these statistics suggested and freaked people out. It was really scrawny and, and weak and... and, and Poor, poor minded and all these horrible things. What in the world is going on? Industrialization. It has corrupted our society. Look at how materialistic people are now. Look at how, how weak they are, how frail minded, how unwilling they are to go out and fight for king and queen and country like they were in the past. Basically, it's a combination of look at how really well the Boers are doing, how really successful these little independent commando groups have been in proving a massive nuisance to our British soldiers, our boys in khaki, you know, down there fighting them off, which should have been an easy mission. We expected this would be a really easy war, and it's lasting a lot longer than we anticipated. Then you look at our own populations, and as it turns out, massive, unprecedented numbers of them are being turned down for military service because they're medically unable to do so. Even if they had to defend their country, you're saying they're not even able to do so? And then, of course, combine that modern situation, you look at, and then you, you have people idealizing and looking back at the past as if it was just, oh, so much better and oh, so much more rosy. You know, back when we were fighting Napoleon and saving Europe all on our own, no help from the Germans or the Spanish, or all those sorts of ideals, or the Russians, heaven forbid. And then, and you know, all these different factors, the idealization of the past and the bad situation in the present, and people, people start to panic in a way, and they look at the boar and they think, wow, the noble savage. The ideal of the noble savage comes right back during this time period in the Second Boer War. Now, it does help, of course, that the Boers are still a white and Christian population. They are still Europeans, after a sense, living in European fashion, just in an African environment. And so people are able to look at this older snapshot of a, of a previous lifetime, if you will, and say, wow, how much more pure they are, how noble they are. Why are we fighting a war against them? We should be learning from them to go back to our roots so we can regain our masculine traits and, and you know, all those traditional Victorian ideals that many people were seeing as being either lost or just hollowed out by the uh, more economic, if you will, realities of the time period. So, so that, to put it very simply, uh, maybe not so simply, but that, the idea is, 
is how many British in their society saw the Boers as, as a noble race, as a proud peoples, that we are going down and through our methods of barbarism are just eradicating these people who truly are better than us. And that really is how a lot of the anti-war uh, rhetoric and sentiment was really termed and phrased during this period, saying we shouldn't be fighting them because really they're better than us. In a society, in a time period, of course, where so much of warfare is reliant on the white man's burden rhetoric and the ideal of going abroad for noble reasons to bring civilization to people, well, here we have a people whom many are viewing as having, in a way, a superior civilization because it breeds better men, better people overall, unlike our own. So that's a positive way in which many people saw the Boer population during the war. But of course, it was hardly the case that every Briton saw the Boer in such a light. Indeed, uh, odds are for everyone who saw them in such a positive manner, there was another, if not more, uh, Britons who saw them in a very negative light. And it's interesting because the negative portrayal of the Boers really does follow in a very similar uh, way. It sort of follows a similar path as the positive portrayal of them does. It just sort of veers off towards the end. You see, uh, again, we mentioned earlier that the Boers were viewed, at least, as a rather isolated people. So they were separate, they were distinctive, they were not really a part anymore of the European ideals, of the European society, of those industrial Victorian societies and ideals. Now, rather than seeing this as a positive thing, many people saw this as a negative thing. They saw them being cut off from civilization and as such culturally stagnating, not developing, not achieving the same progression that so many Victorian societies had. Of course, the ideal of the progression of history towards an ultimate good, it was just continual progress being made, is a very Victorian ideal. And these Boers were completely cut off from all of that. They were uncultured, uncivilized, they were brutish and cruel and, and crude living peoples, just scraping a living off the rocks around them. And this way of seeing the Boers as having been cut off from civilization and as such just stagnating and rotting as a peoples and as a cultures really is quite, I won't say wonderfully, but, but very well, I suppose, sort of summarized and, 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 and brought together really by a single quote from, of course, this man right here, uh, Lord Herbert Kitchener. The, um, well, we all know Herbert Kitchener, I'm sure. Uh, he described the Boers as being, and this is an exact quote. Keep that in mind, people, before you go off and misquote things. This is an exact quote from Lord Kitchener. He referred to them as, the, the Boers that is, Afrikanders with a thin white veneer. And there is... <laughs> An awful lot to unpack with a quote like that. Because, well, in its most immediate sense, of course, what Kitchener is saying is that the Boers have been cut off from white society for so long that they've basically gone native. You know, we've all heard those stories of, like, say, colonial America, where the frontiersmen will go off and live with the Indians for a while, the Native Americans, and then they come back and they're no longer fit for civilized, you know, uh, Western, uh, British, English society. Similar idea here. The Boers have been cut off from the Europeans for so long, they turned, they, they've practically turned African in their culture, in their ways, in their manners and whatnot. They've gone native. They've, they've gone local. Uh, He's saying that aside from the thin veneer, the, the thin, yes, the fact that th their actual flesh is white, they have this faint pale veneer about them as, yes, proper Europeans and white men do, Caucasian men. Uh, of course, beyond that, they are in their souls deep down, truly they are little more than Afrikanders. Uh, he's, they're black. They, they are black Africans beneath that white veneer is what he's saying. And of course, the implication uh, otherwise being, as you would expect from a Victorian perspective, a militaristic perspective, and good old Lord Kitchener here, who's, God, such a fascinating and confusing figure in so many ways. Um, the implication, of course, being, yes, that, um, that Africans, black Africans, were, you know, 
everything that a European man would not want to be. They were often viewed as brutish and crude and certainly very physically and martially skilled, uh, but, but these were animalistic traits in their sense. Uh, they, they did not have the same discipline and honor and decorum of a European soldier. Uh, they were more, uh, again, animalistic in their uh, bloodlust and whatnot. This is how Kitchener is describing the Boers and largely because they had been so long separated from European society that they they lost their way. They went native. And that really was the other side of how so many Britons, you know, not only Lord Kitchener, but it's very popular mindset at the time. Keep in mind, Kitchener was like a celebrity in his day. He says that sort of thing, and you can rest assured that there will be many, many people on the streets repeating his words and sort of uh, copying his perspective in that way. Um, you know, that's the other perspective of things, viewing them as not a noble savage, but just as a savage. Now, of course, both of these perspectives as well, we would view them today as being still uh, disparaging, as, as racist, we'd use the term now, as, as, as negative, as bad stereotypes, because of course, whether you're a noble savage or just a savage, you're still using the word savage, which is kind of iffy by modern standards. But, but um, you know, back in the day, uh, to the, British, to the British public in the British Empire, there were these two main ways of seeing the Boer population as noble savage and as just plain old savage. And these two competing ideas of how the British viewed their enemy really did inform massively how the British went about fighting their war, waging this conflict, and it did inspire many things such as the methodologies the British used in later on in the conflict, hunting down the Boer commandos and, of course, restricting supplies to them. That being the scorched earth policy and the moving of these very disparate, loose populations, moving them all into these very heavily concentrated, more industrialized European army discipline standard white, if you will, uh, concentration camps. Taking them from the Boer way of life and giving them a proper, proper British way of life in the concentration camps. As it turns out, of course, they were not ready or capable of dealing with a European, a British, a white way of living in the concentration camps. Um, but that is a whole other conversation. Of course, there's an awful lot more going on with the concentration camps than the racialist perspectives and the, you know, um, these idealistic, these, uh, not idealistic, but these um, ideology-driven um, perspectives. There's a lot more going on in the concentration camps and why they became a thing than just that. That is just one uh, side of things in a very, very complicated topic of conversation, which, again, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I did touch on the concentration camps and why why they were established um, for the more, you know, military and uh, more practical concerns in that video series which I hosted for, again, Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian, and his new website, uh, thearmchairhistorian.com. Uh, again, BOR50! Use that code and you'll get your 50% off! Uh, the first 75 people, incidentally, to use that code will get that uh, rate off. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier or not, but whether or not I did, um, Yes, indeed. I suppose that's going to be it. Thank you all so very much for watching. Of course, in particular, to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, whose, indeed, financial support does allow me to carry on with the work that I do. Uh, and then, of course, to you yourself, my dear viewer. Thank you so very much for watching. And, of course, until the next time, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of seven.